Thank you, everyone, for coming on Saturday. I think it was, some of you were late because of S1, probably. I can't blame you. But yeah, I think we can get started slowly. So first of all, thank you very much for coming. As I said, today, um, as part of Munich NLP, we will have a session to let you know everything you need to know about LLMs. I hope you appreciate the amount of prompting went to this picture to get you right. So yeah, I mean, but maybe uh, first before we move on, maybe I can say a few words before Munich NLP. As a matter uh, of fact, uh, Munich NLP started after Tomb AI Hackathon. So we have a kind of a good bonding there. And we were funded last year in mine by a bunch of students. We are mainly based on Discord and we have over a thousand members. We try to do paper reading events. We try to uh, have uh, practical sessions, invite researchers from Google Brain, all the notable ones to come to talk about their work. So this is the link to join Discord. And you can yeah, go ahead and uh, scan it if you want. A few things before we start. Logistically, slides will be available. Every prompt, everything is in the details. So you don't need to ask me what was the prompt about the image, etc. And feel free uh, to stop me and ask any question. Uh, this is pretty cool environment. This is not like university lecture where a professor will be boring just saying anything. So you can raise your hand and ask questions. So let's go back uh, about today's topic. Uh, yeah, uh, I tried to compile everything I read so far in the last few years and kind of compress it to a very good set of stuff uh, that you need to know about LLMs to get you started. So here's the outline. Uh, we will start with text generation and how transformers work. And then we will go to the wonderland of LLMs to kind of get you up to speed what are the different LLMs. And then we will discuss the very uh, Shakespearean question to fine tune or not. And then we will see how to align those LLMs to human values and some perks about those alignments and alignment text probably. And then we will go through Lama 2 overview in a nutshell, and then we'll have a hands-on session. So you also uh, have a practical experience there. And then we'll conclude with a take-home message and then hopefully you can go enjoy the sunny weather outside. So yeah, let's start with text generation and Transformers deep dive. Uh, so the essential question that Transformer tries to solve is basically how to generate the next word very reliably and predictably to a very accurate degree. So I, I, I'm sure all of you have phones and you had this system before that you type and then the uh, keyboard tries to predict the next word. And uh, I bet you're frustrated sometimes because it makes uh, syntactical errors and it doesn't capture the whole, whole semantics uh, of the message you are trying to write your friend. And uh, as I said, the problem most of the time is that if you keep like tapping the, the middle one, which is uh, uh, in iOS at least, uh, refers to the highest probability of the word that comes next, you will end up with very uh, like jugglish message which doesn't uh, mean anything. I'm sure you have uh, faced this at least once. Raise your hand if you have faced at least once. Okay, yeah, I see some. Uh, and, but I mean, good news for you. If you're an iPhone user, actually Apple announced that they will use this thing called transformer language model that will help you uh, write a better message to your friend. So if you have updated to your to iOS 17 or macOS latest release, I am sure you have seen this uh, thing where it tries to predict the next word and it does so very good and uh, tries to capture the whole context of the conversation. And uh, I'm sure there will be many things in this workshop, but if you get lost, just remember these two things. The square, red square thing is transformer and it refers to the architecture. And uh, the round one is the LLM, which is the refined version of transformer, which have been fed a lot of data. So let's go, let's see behind the scenes. Many people often confuse transformers with Optimus Prime, etc. but this is not the case actually. Yeah. Uh, let's see behind the scenes. What is this? thing called transformer language model that everybody is trying to use these days, even Apple doing on-device processing. If we take behind the scenes look, it's basically this architecture, but don't worry, we will have a very holistic view and we will take, we will go one level upper and essentially it will result in two main blocks, encoder and decoder, 
and then set of uh, inputs and outputs together with matrix multiplications in between. And uh, if you go one level higher again, it will be just uh, one black box or like red box, not black box in this case, called transformer. And uh, if you take a functional view, it will basically do, uh, you will feed in a bunch of text and then it will try to predict what's next, ca capturing its uh, contextual meaning. I see some people coming. Uh, maybe you can ask them. There are places. Okay. No problem. There are places here also, maybe in the middle. Yeah. So that's essentially the functional view of transformer. But I would also try to touch like essential components in a very high level, and then we will move on. Uh, it all starts with tokenization. Uh, uh, as you might already know, computers don't speak uh, in strings, but rather they talk in numbers or uh, floating point operations, whatever uh, you like to call them. And this is the process of tokenization. You first tokenize the model, and this is uh, a tokenization process encapsulated. So uh, a bunch of recurring words, if you use different algorithms, will end up in different tokens. <laughs> and then the next step in transformer is that you try to embed these uh, tokens. The problem with token is that they are single uh, numbers most of the time, and uh, you want to try to capture them in a continuous space. And this uh, embedding layer in transformer tries to capture them in a continuous space. So you can do a bunch of uh, uh, matrix multiplications, addition, et cetera. So you can mathematically capture them. And this is the whole embedding process. After you tokenize, uh, the words will be converted to a, uh, to a matrix or a vector. And then the next step is that, as I said uh, before, it tries to capture those tokens in a continuous space so you can uh, reliably uh, calculate the similarity between them, et cetera. So, and the property of this uh, embedding layer is that it's learnable and transformer kind of also learns the uh, representations of these tokens behind the scenes. So, so you can do some similarity, et cetera. And then you have positional encoding. So the crux of transformer architecture is that it tries to, uh, process your input in parallel, and hence you need to know the position of your uh, tokens or words. Uh, otherwise the model will end up uh, hallucinating or like saying some gibberish. That's why you need to, cap you need a way to capture a position of those words because the transformers processes them in parallel. And then uh, you go one layer up, uh, you end up with the attention uh, very, kind of not novel uh, technique that was presented in attention paper, but it was circulating around in academic circles, even before attention all you need. But these folks at uh, Google really tried to put up all these uh, elements together. And uh, attention basically works like this. Uh, it tries to capture uh, which words uh, semantically capture some meaning. So if you have this sentence like money in the bank, and if you, throw it uh, through attention, it will probably understand that money and bank are related. So this is the whole crux of attention. And then you end up with feed for a forward neural network, which basically multiplies all these numbers that you've seen so far. And you will end up with a set of scores uh, uh, that uh, this transformer believes that uh, I have all this vocabulary of uh, words and I will give a score to these uh, words, which is the most probable to the next word that is upcoming. Uh, but you need to convert this uh, set of uh, scores, which don't add up to one, to a probabilities so that you can reliably choose and sample from them. And then I think uh, as we go, this uh, high level uh, animation really shows what I've been trying to uh, explain you guys for the last few slides. So as you see, the sentence come and it goes through a lot of layers and you will end up with the scores and probability scores of all the words that the model thinks are, is the next word uh, of continuation of this sentence. And then you can sample them like, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. You can uh, sample the, like the highest probability or you can sample few of them and then continue generating. But essentially this is the high level overview. And then 
the whole end-to-end -end process looks like this, where the sentence goes again, and then after you did a bunch of matrix multiplication, uh, you will select one token and feed it again and again and again. This is essentially the whole, arc there are some places here if you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think. So yeah, this is the autoregressive nature of transformers. Uh, basically same as your uh, T9 that you had in your phones, but they basically do a lot of computation behind the scenes and try to uh, predict the next word in a very uh, high precision manner. And the, the thing with these uh, transformers or the, at least the ones that are pre-trained is that you can't, you can't talk with them directly. They will try to just auto-complete everything you put into them. That's why we will come to fine tuning and then how people use these uh, transformers to do a lot of other tasks. And then uh, I maybe some practical tips that maybe you want to remember. Always remember that these uh, transformer models, they don't see characters, they see tokens. That's why some people like uh, try a uh, few ideas and they say, oh, transformer can't like uh, reverse a string or they, they can't uh, count up to certain numbers. Uh, you should remember that those don't see characters, as I said again, but see tokens. So if you uh, give them a token representation in a very good manner, or if you split your uh, uh, words, then uh, it will reliably do so, whatever you are trying to say. So just uh, whatever you try to do with transformers, just always remember that they see tokens and maybe sometimes thinking in token representation and give it the instruction is a better way to put it. So that's it so far. Before I move on, I would like to take some questions if there are any. Please. So what's the short 13 that you've shown during this optimization? Sorting? ROT 13. Okay. ROT 13, let me see. Oh, it was like on the last slides. Last slides, okay. Maybe you can help me. Again. Again, this one. Forward. Forward. Again. Okay. No problem. Yeah, this one. In ah, okay. I'm not sure what exactly it is. And for tokenization and embedding, are they always separate levels or at times the same? Yeah, separate levels because as you remember, first we tokenize the inputs and because these tokens are just like uh, 327 or something, we need to uh, put them in a continuous space so that uh, we can do this comparison, as I said before, and then those uh, embedding representation are learnable by transformer. So you can't directly take a singular value and uh, try to do some operations in continuous space. That's why you need another layer of embedding to do so. So when do we expect semantically similar? In embedding layer, yeah, in embedding, Embe layer. embedding layer. So okay. embedding layer tries to capture the semantics and the similarities of these tokens. So tokens is just a way to talk with the computer, let's say, just the numerical representation. So just so numerical that, representation of text. Yes, the and then, so the, then... Why do we have this method uh, for? tokenization. Yes. Because uh, for different languages, it's actually a very good question. Thank you for bringing it up. For different languages, uh, different tokenization met methods can be applied. And uh, for example, there are many details that I'm sure if you have taken linguistic course, you have seen it. That, for example, uh, in an English language, uh, running can be decomposed to run and ing, right? And then you can come up with algorithms that try to capture these different tokens. But for example, uh, for like uh, Japanese language or Chinese language, where you have a very different uh, like set of characters, uh, the tokenizations that you applied in English wouldn't reliably work. So that's why people try to come with a universal approximation of uh, tokens across the languages. That's why we have different uh, kind of tokenizers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's actually a very good question. You should also bear in mind uh, different tokenizers that you use during the usage of these transformers. Yeah. Any other questions before more? If you don't uh, sh be shy and feel free to ask questions. Uh, this one later okay this one okay sure so yeah just remember what I said right that model doesn't see uh, characters but it sees tokens so some people go up hey transformer in one sentence they say 
try to reverse this alphabet, uh, this word for me. And it, it, it can't do so. It, it, we can try, but I think I can show you even after the words. So if you just try to say it, reverse the word below and give it alphabet, it wouldn't like reverse it, okay? Because it sees alphabet maybe as a whole token or like alpha and bet, okay? That's why uh, the model does can't like uh, reverse it. But if you separate it and make it see it as a token, so for example, alphabet can be A, L, P, et cetera, et cetera, then it can see the that these are actually different words and then it will reverse. That's what I try to convey as a message that uh, whatever you do, uh, just bear in mind that it's kind of functionality of transformer. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm trying to convey that just remember that sometimes don't like blindly say that, hey, transformer, reverse the string or reverse the list that I have. And then it fails so, and then don't be like uh, Gary Marcus and go on Twitter, hey, transformer can't do this, but just try to understand the process. Yes. So it's... It's a very hard question because uh, different tokenizers uh, have different, like... I can't suggest anything, so I'm just giving this example. Uh, with this, also this model that I tried is TextDaVinci 2. Maybe it's already outdated, so maybe GPT-4 tokenizer is a little bit, little bit different. But just, yeah, the main message here to not go into details is that just try to remember that they see tokens. So when you ask them some task, maybe giving them token representation is better. Yeah, please. I have a question again for the exercise setting. So uh -huh. I'm always a little bit confused. Is the embedding layer, you're asking. It's like Jupyter, right? No, they, uh, no, they learn it as far as I know during the uh, process. Like when you train the model to predict the next word, it also uh, tries to learn this embedding. That's that's it's a learnable parameter actually. It doesn't come like. Yeah. How do we make sure that like the embedding will like actually meaningful? So, so it's just I mean, the, you just uh, hope that you throw a bunch of text and then it comes up. I mean, there are more fancy techniques and stuff to do embedding separately and then doing, but I think for yeah. at least the scope yeah. of this talk. Yeah, usually it's end to end, at least in the transformer context. So maybe I think we can go ahead and let's go to Wonderland of LLMs and see different LLMs. I, I'm sure you have seen at least GPT, but then there's like, different whole family of large language models. And the uh, pre-training at a very high level, how these models are trained is that you scrap the internet and then you do some quality filtering and then you convert them to tokens and throw with these models with a bunch of GPUs. And as I said, they try to uh, learn the embeddings and also uh, try to predict the next word and autocomplete reliably. And the good thing about this LLM is that because they've been trained in large corpora of text, they uh, contain the statistical knowledge of the language that they have been pre-trained. That's why people just, uh, when they do fine tuning, they essentially do transfer learning. They say that, uh, okay, this model that they've been pre-trained already knows about English. So I can assume that this will also work when I fine tune it on some downstream task. And then uh, one of the success factors for most of LLMs have been that uh, the scale and they just uh, made the model bigger and uh, throw more GPUs and throw uh, more data. And it did uh, predict the next word very good than previously. So uh, one of the success factors of LLMs is actually scale. And then, uh, as I said before, these LLMs capture very good the semantic and the uh, statistical knowledge of the language that you pre-trained. And then you basically, after you did, you pre-trained these LLMs, you take them and then give them a prompt and a completion or sometimes a prompt and instruction and the completion, or maybe in a chat format chat and like 
uh, chat responses like user and uh, assistant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this model tries to also be a very helpful assistant at the end of the day uh, by this process. I think, and then the other factor of this LLM is that people have found a way to frame all tasks in the kind of natural language instruction. And that's what have been also a big part of success of ChatGPT and other model that say they, they have the knowledge of the uh, instructions uh, in a natural language and they try to predict the response also in natural language. So people have come up with a very good data sets of these uh, uh, instructions and then they did some fine tuning and it showed that the LLM are really good at following these instructions. And then some more frameworks to think about these LLMs. I think it's very uh, important. Uh, you can think of them as probabilistic programs uh, statistical calculators, maybe autocomplete on steroids, but when it comes to reasoning or etc., or even like following the instruction, always remember that they are kind of approximately retrieving from the memory that they've been trained on. And then you can also uh, uh, like think of them as function. You can say that's generate a poem uh, and then it will generate at least for the fine tuned versions of the model that have been uh, done so to follow your instructions. And maybe like always remember that sometimes they're very convincing liars. So you shouldn't take at face value what they're saying. I really like this blog post, but by one of the researchers that kind of, uh, uh, he wrote it himself, but he essentially captures what are the LLMs. It says a large language model. I can only think forward, never backward. I, uh, I am a language model and I, uh, encapsulate the culture that they have been trained on and so on and so forth. It's a very good read. I have linked it. Maybe you can read it after the workshop. And this is the typical life cycle of the uh, this like generative AI or like AI project these days that they take the transformer, of course, but first you need to define the use case. And then maybe you will uh, think, should I take the existing model uh, or pretend my own? Typically, pretending your own is always costlier. And then you should always start with prompt engineering and then move gradually to fine tuning and then aligning with uh, your values, whatever that might be in your case. And then, of course, you need to evaluate those models uh, because, as I said before, they sometimes they can hallucinate and they are very convincing liars. And then uh, if you want to uh, do application integration, there you think about the inference optimization, the cost, and then other factors. And to set expectations straight, I'm sure that you have maybe uh, noticed it that building some really cool demos with LLMs is really easy, but actually building an end-to-end -end product is really hard. So you need to set your expectations really good. So yeah, uh, nobody is telling me, tell me more, but yeah, okay, I will skip it. So yeah, let's come to other questions to fine tune or not, right? So. People always call this paradigm of transfer learning fine tuning, but it's mostly not fine, uh, at least for the people who have not access to high-end GPUs because many things can go wrong. So it's certainly not fine, but it's okay, okay tuning. I would call it okay tuning. And then yeah, uh, as you decide what you should do, as I said before, you should start with prompt engineering and then gradually go towards uh, higher. Let me see if this one works. Okay, then I will just try to point with my hand. So as I said, and this axis is the complexity of the method. And then this uh, on the X axis is the problems addressed. So if you care about uh, the style of the problem or the form, and then the factuality of the problem that they are trying to solve using these LLMs, you should start with uh, manual or automatic prompt. Uh, prompting the language model because in, it tries to encapsulate both. And then it, as you go higher, maybe you can uh, do some more fancy methods to come up with prompts to solve your problem. Uh, but uh, people have shown that over the past few months with these LLMs that fine tune, if you try to fine tune these la large language models, they usually address the style of the language models. They can help you, for example, to write in a Shakespeare style. But if you want to address factual problems, usually fine tuning is not the way for these LLMs. And then you should do a technique called uh, RAG, which I, I will come in a while. And then you go one le level higher, which is more complex. And if you 
also encapsulates at, and addresses both form problems and factual problems. And this is the enforcement learning from human feedback. And then the hardest and the most resource intensive is pre-training from scratch, which uh, only big labs these days do. And then this is the essentially uh, what I said before about addressing the factuality of these LLMs. If you just uh, ask LLM off the shelf, it will always try to uh, retrieve approximately from its memory and answer your question. That's why there is a very large uh, probability that it will hallucinate on your question. That's why the fancy method here is that you basically do Google search first. You come up with the list of uh, uh, documents or like answers that is very relevant to your task and then feed it to LLM as a context. Hey, given this context and given this question, please answer this question. And it kind of constrains the LLM to not hallucinate. And then, uh, yeah, I thought by this year people wanted flying cars, but a lot of people actually want to chat with their documents. So that's why this uh, architecture that I mentioned before is very popular these days. Raise your hand if you already worked with this one. Okay, I say at least three. So yeah, I mean, this is very common. And I've actually seen people even uh, building chatbots to chat with the docs document. So it's like, it was at the beginning, very killer app. Right now it's hello world. And you can uh, write this app, maybe using Langchain and Llama index in five or 10 lines of code. So this is very easy to do. But as I said, easy to do the demo. If you want to encapsulate all edge cases, you need to think more of that. And then uh, you can for formulate some hypothesis. Uh, actually, before we move on, maybe some more questions and then we can move on. Um, yeah. Am I going too fast, too slow? Any feedbacks or, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, please. This static dynamic thing on the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> like okay. So sometimes uh, the way you prompt these uh, LLMs is that they are very, as I said, very uh, sensitive to tokens, et cetera, right? So even adding new lines sometimes can help depending on the model nature. This is less of a problem with uh, uh, of closed source models like GPT-4, they're like really robust to new lines, et cetera. But then maybe, uh, so this is the example I learned recently that some people have been trying to test Falcon model to answer the questions about basic arithmetic. So what is two plus two is four, right? But then they couldn't like get really this answer back from Falcon and they started to experiment with different formats. And the problem is that they just uh, needed to add one more extra space at the end for the model to uh, kind of answer the questions. That's like example selection for the prompt. That's what I was trying to convey. Yeah, but maybe uh, it's kind of different in uh, academic papers these days that like, people come up with different names. But in this context, that's what I know, like to select your examples in a way that the model answers the, your question. This is kind of optimizing the way you input. So this is more, yeah. Can you also explain the retrieval assistive generation? Yes, so th this is actually retrieval assistive generation where you first retrieve uh, because as I said, when you ask the model directly, it goes and approximately retrieves from its memory of training data. And there is high chance of hallucinating before because it doesn't know your, what you're asking it to do, right? So if you want to uh, make a chatbot assistant to answer your docs document, you say that, hey, LLM, I, this is the uh, kind of uh, the documents that I already retrieved for you. Uh, please take them and answer the question. So this is kind of first retrieve and then generate. That's a okay, whole paradigm. And let's go, yeah, uh, I think we can, move. yeah, please. Yeah. No, this is actually, uh, this is actually to, to this point, but I didn't want to go too much in the details. Of course, you need to do some, as I said, Demo is easy. You can basically do the demo. It's very easy. But when you go to production, as you said, you need to make sure that the uh, retrieved answers are ranked properly so that because sometimes LLMs are also very uh, sensitive to the order of the inputs you give them, etc. So yeah, I didn't just want to go into details and just give high level overview. I think we are good, at least for now. Maybe we can skip the questions. Okay. I'm good on time. Uh, so yeah, uh, before you fine tune, you can also formulate some hypothesis. You can think 
like because these models have been trained on internet, if your company's data is like very secret and then very like niche domain, uh, that's very like probably internet doesn't contain this knowledge of your companies. That's where you, you can uh, hypothesize that probably a fine tuning will help this LLM to perform better. But if you see that your your prompting is working very good, then it's a very good indicator that when you fine tune it, it will even uh, boost the performance of this LLM. And then uh, if you really care about token budget and you are doing lots of prompt engineering to get the right answer from these LLMs, probably fine tuning will help you save down on the cost of token because the model will basically remember the prompt you always use during fine tuning. And then you don't need to write a long prompt again for it to get the answer. So you will end up of cost. And then people have shown that really, if you kind of, uh, for different tasks, of course, that's very task dependent, uh, but uh, uh, most of the time, uh, if you fine tune properly, uh, the models, open source models can uh, beat uh, large models like GPT-4 on very specific tasks. For example, we have this functional representation and SQL generation, but of course, as you see, uh, open source models very lag on mass problems. That's the problem because maybe GPT-4 have been uh, more, much more larger a uh, corpora of mass text, etc. But just remember that sometimes uh, you don't necessarily need GPT-4. Sometimes if you have the right data set and you formulated the problem correctly, you can uh, outperform GPT-4 on task specific uh, data sets. And then the other things that you need to remember during the uh, fine tuning uh, is that most of the time, if you overdo it, uh, there is a high chance that the model will enter this concept called catastrophic forgetting, uh, which is basically that because you give it many examples of other tasks, it will forget other stuff it uh, learned during the pre-training. So this is the fancy way of putting it, uh, which is also case for humans, right? Sometimes we also forget what we learned during high school, etc. Uh, anyway, so this is kind of in a high level uh, for full fine tuning of large language models. And this is very challenging because you need to take into account uh, many uh, kind of set of weights. Uh, I won't go to the details, but just high level, uh, what are those weights? And then uh, the problem is that uh, you run off, out of memory, you need the GPU. Uh, if you need GPU, by the way, Akin is in the back, she can provide you some GPUs. <laughs> You can reach out to her after the talk. But yeah, usually for like uh, folks, like uh, it's very hard uh, to fine tune because you can't fit it in one computer. And then this is the approximate numbers, uh, uh, at least for the GPU RAM that you need to store the LLMs with 1 billion parameters. And if you need to save them in full precision, you will need four gigabytes of memory. And if you quantize them to 16 bits, so that's half precision, you will get up with two gigabytes you need at least two gigabytes to store the memory. And then if you quantize further, you will need one gigabyte. So let's say that we took the Llama model and quantize it uh, to eight bit. And it's we essentially need one gigabyte of uh, GPU RAM to store it. So uh, let's say the smallest one, uh, smallest Llama, which is 7 billion right now. So you will need at least seven gigabytes of memory just to store this in your computer which I'm sure most of people who buy the base uh, computers, at least the students don't appreciate, right? Because we need this memory. And then uh, this is the approximate numbers for the GPU RAM to train this model. So this is drastically high because uh, you, as I said, you need to take into account many uh, intermediate layer of the model. And th this is really high numbers. So if we just go with the simplest one, it's 80 gigabyte. Uh, and uh, at full precision, that's you're already out of memory for the highest end uh, consumer GPU, quote unquote, uh, from NVIDIA, which is essentially just gives you 80 gigabytes. So you need to quantize them and you need to take into account. So, and then as your model gets higher and higher uh, in terms of parameters, you really need lots of GPUs and you want to split them across them because there is no single GPU or even chip in the world that can store all these uh, models without distributing them. Uh, that's why, uh, because you all GPU poor like me, 
uh, you need to other ways to train these models, uh, which we will have in our hands-on session. And there's very nice tool, uh, model memory calculator, at least for inference, it gives you reliably the prediction. Uh, so if you input the hugging face model uh, name, it will give you some estimate numbers of how much GPU memory you need to do the inference in this column, and then uh, some estimation to do training using Adam Optimizer. So it's very hefty, uh, nice tool. You have a question? Yeah, but you say this is more accurate than what's stated on the uh, hugging face page with respect to the model. I think this is based on the the numbers from the documentation of hugging face transformers. So this is also, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, this is estimation, of course. You always need to into account other, like maybe your GPU driver needs some more uh, additional memory. So it's always to take it with a grain of salt and it's just a maybe imperfect. Uh, is this only for GPU or? It's just GPU. So far, there are some efforts to do the, at least the inference on the CPUs, but uh, you need sparse, uh, you need the sparse matrices for those uh, uh, like CPU inference and most of the chips are not really uh, work well as far as I know with sparse representation etc. Can be running on CPU, CPU as well. CPU, yeah, it can be run, but it can be very slow etc. And then yeah. you need a lot more work to do with CPUs. That's what at least my experience is. But yeah, sure. Mm. And I have the feeling that the fine tuning a bit less important, perhaps, as we call it also becoming more trend as the model is increasing size, which is a trend that you also see in your opinion no. in the importance of fine tuning for the use case is it increasing uh from what I see, so maybe my sample is not the perfect, but uh at least for the past week, many people uh, because most of the people uh, try to do task specific stuff, for example, you have a product that does storage generation only, right? You don't need like the whole uh, big model to do a lot of tasks for you. So they essentially cut down a lot of costs and it's getting cheaper because a lot of people right now are working on these problems and the it's industry is really focused to save them costs, the inference time, etc. The pattern I have seen is that many people drop GPT-4 uh, as API they fine tune latest model, for example, from Mistral, which is very good. And they basically show that for my task, this uh, model is uh, basically much cheaper and much better. So this is the trend I see at least, but yeah, maybe this will change in a few okay. times. Yes, so the, I mean, they also some experiments I can, I would be happy to give you at the end of the talk that they spent the same amount of money to fine tune GPT uh, via the OpenAI API and then Mistral from, uh, or some other open source model. And it showed that most of the time for the same money, you will get better performance from open source models. So, I mean, I believe that industry is really uh, keen to save costs on this problem. So we will see a lot of optimizations. Uh, let's go. That's why, uh, because we are, most of us are GPU poor, we need a more reliable way to do uh, uh, fine tuning. And this is the method called parameter efficient fine tuning. And the whole crux of this method is that you just take some layers, certain layers of LLMs, and then you freeze them and you just train them. And that's essentially parameter efficiency uh, in a core. Let's go further. And the green sign shows that this way you can, can basically train in one GPU. You don't need many GPUs because you just select certain uh, parameters. Although it's also not really like uh, solved yet. Uh, some people really struggle to do parameter efficient fine tuning because there is always trade off, right? You need to choose the right parameters, etc. But that's uh, out of scope of this talk. And the other kind of benefit of this parameter efficient fine tuning is that you uh, usually when you fine tune, uh, f do full fine tuning, you need to uh, save each copy of this fine tuned version, which is, as I said, very uh, memory intensive stuff and they require a lot of space. So if you fine tune on uh, question answering tasks, you will need to store another LLM just to do this uh, question answering and so on and so forth. And what the benefit of this uh, uh, parameter efficient fine tuning is that most of the time you just need that specific layer that you trained and then you can uh, there are many ways to just merge those ways back and then 
you also save up on the memory. So as I said, you can just, for example, uh, the yellow part is question answering, and then you can take those memory and just wrap it around this basic LLM and you will save up on the memory. I hope it's clear. If it's not clear, maybe I can go again. Okay. And then there is a range of uh, parameter efficient methods. And, uh, but today I would like just to briefly touch upon the low rank adaptation. And yeah, it's uh, the technique that have been like uh, uh, gaining a lot of popularity. And the whole uh, kind of also uh, main idea behind this low rank adaptation is that you uh, researchers have found that if we select only self attention layer and if we do some fancy matrix multiplication techniques, uh, we will end up with almost same representation as we saw during full fine tuning. And there is actually a very nice proof behind it. And the proof is that we will skip it. We, leave, uh, we only live so long that we just skipped it proof. And if you're interested, I would like to refer you to the original paper of Laura to learn more about the dynamics. But uh, what I essentially want you to get back uh, after this workshop is that there are different methods and to do parameter efficient fine tuning, and this is one of them. And uh, yeah, so this is the next uh, uh, method, uh, next, uh, next topic that I would love to talk, but maybe we can take some more questions and then move on. Please, you have a question? No? Yeah. It's good. I love uh, lively discussion, maybe from here to the yeah, start. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you said open source LLMs may overperform. Under like specific tasks. Task for yeah. example, if I were to use LLMs for clustering mm -hmm. for some reason, would you say you could, you, would, you, you could recommend one open source LLM? To so it, it depends, right? What's your task? What are you trying to cluster? Text, images, uh, sentiment? Yes. I have a list of uh, company names. Uh -huh. And a list of project ideas, and uh -huh. I also have a list of company web page purposes, mm -hmm. and I want to find which companies may do which project together or alone. Okay, that's interesting uh, problem not formulation. Not like embeddings and then cluster, but we would try to do something with LLMs. No, actually, also the first thing that came to mind is first to cluster them use outside LLM, and then feed it in a good way uh, that the LLM can kind of do some like. So you, essentially, yeah, you need to translate your task to natural language and then try to get back the natural language response from this uh, LLM back, right? So you need to formulate, you, you need to come up with the way to formulate your- That's the only way. Uh, that's what comes to my mind, but I think you, basically my friendly advice is that start small, uh, maybe try with a smaller LLM, like even one billion parameter and gradually go up and try for yourself because Almost all papers claim something, but at the end of the day, when you try it out, it doesn't work out. So my friendly advice, start from the bottom and then just try it for yourself. And I can't run. Still not really run them on local as well, right? Uh, you, you can run them on local. I will show you in the upcoming slides. Okay. To run the inference, you mean, or to train them to local? Uh, the, you can also run them locally, but uh, you need to quantize them and their methods like, uh, we can have more talk after this. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, sorry if I missed that detail. So essentially, as I said, so retrieval assisted generation, right? First you retrieve, but before you retrieve, you chunk these PDFs in a certain sizes so that these LLMs don't overflow the context. And then you just uh, hope that uh, if you just build a naive retrieval method, that your embedding captures the semantic meaning of your paragraphs of PDF, and then it can retrieve them reliably. So the choice of embedding first is very important, and then the chunk size. There are many research these days how to set the chunk size. So the very good technique I've seen so far is that you chunk the sentence, and then, for example, uh, when the user asks the question, you find the sentence, but you try to give the sentence before and after to the LLM so it can give you better answer. So you have you can do a lot of like optimization techniques there, but essentially you need to chunk them first so that 
you don't hit the limit of these LLMs. I hope that's clear. Yeah, did you basically do cosine similarity? I think just I see one and then yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so as I said, the good proxy for fine tuning before you move on to fine tuning is that you do some prompt engineering and you first see if the model is going doing good or so or not. And then it will kind of give you a good proxy. If it's really doing good on your prompts, then your fine tuning will really good work, uh, will work really good on your task. But in terms of embeddings, uh, if you, mostly if you are like, um, the language that you want to fine tune is have been captured by, by the LLM, you are more or less can be sure that this uh, the embeddings are fine, yeah. But if you're like very low resource language like Japanese, which haven't been captured by big models and they can't, the tokenizers are not really good. That's why you need to maybe swap the tokenizer. It's a very like kind of uh, detailed topic, I would say. So we can have more chat if you want. No, you can do some proxies beforehand, right? So as I said, is it low resource language? Go look up the tokenizers that the model have been trained on or not, and then et cetera, please. Yes. Yes. So is there like an optimal size of the large language model? To uh, fine tune. To fine tune, I think like, do you see like the return at some point? Um, that depends <laughs> again, because that's very task specific, but for training there, there, are, there are some proxies and uh, like diminishing returns for the pre-training pre part. For fine tuning part, it's very hard to capture all the natures of fine tuning, et cetera. So as I said before, my friendly advice starts small, like uh, 1 billion, 7 billion and go up. But as that graph, graph showed, Lama 2, 7, 7 billion and 13 billion for tasks related to SQL code generation, they're really good on par with 70 billion. Even. So sometimes just go up gradually. That's, there is no proxy this way. So uh, how are we doing on time? Yeah, so far so good. So yeah, uh, now the question is how to align those LLMs or like with human uh, kind of values so that they are not, they won't start cursing the user for saying something. So that's how this comes into play. But before we move on, let's go step back and try to understand what is the objective of this fine tuning or like the instruction fine tuning where you give an instruction and an ideal response to your instruction and the model basically tries to remember those and then it's trained upon them. So for a given input, the target is always a single correct answer, right? For example, in your instruction fine tuning data set, if it asks about story, uh, bad story generation, you always probably give uh, one uh, ideal output and this is, uh, I did not ideal scenario because you try to capture only a single correct answer. And in uh, reinforcement learning theory, this is called behavior cloning. And you basically hope that if you have enough of those instructions, your model can generalize. Uh, but uh, this is not very good because uh, instruction fine tuned large language models uh, can't really capture uh, all the set of instructions that you have. So this uh, requires us to formalize this behavior and this uh, brings us to the next topic where you so people have found out that essentially comparing the outputs is always cheaper than labeling them so if we give enough of the human preferences the model will capture more and generalize better rather than giving it like one two instructions and hoping that it will generalize if you give it enough uh, human preferences that hey human prefers this story, this story, this story, and give it to the model in a good way, the model will generalize better. And this is first perk or first kind of uh, advantage of reinforcement learning uh, fine tuning. And the next uh, perk or let's pro of LLM is that, um, uh, as I said, you always try to make the model helpful, honest and harmless. And this is the uh, triple H terminology that is used these days in research. 
uh, that your model won't start cursing. Uh, you always also try to, because there is no single uh, data set that can contain all the curse words in the world, let's say, just put it in a way. That's why you give it a lot of human preference answers. And let's go to the next. I think this is essentially, can, essentially captures. So you have this instruction fine tuning LLM and you do reinforcement learning from human feedback. You essentially give a lot of uh, human feedbacks that you have constructed as a data set. Unfortunately, the hard reality is that uh, mostly these are outsourced to contingent workers, like maybe in places like Africa or even Philippines. So this is like a harsh reality behind the scenes that mostly uh, the data sets for this come back from like uh, crowdsource workers. So you also need to bear that in mind. Maybe they are also not particularly motivated. So you always uh, should also not blindly trust that the enforcement learning could work. Do you have a question? Very good question. Yeah, sure. Is it possible or common practice for them to not have curse words during the pre-training or the training or pre-processing in the vocabulary at any Yeah, yeah, it's, that's uh, very kind of, that's, you do that uh, filtering quality before you pre-train the model, but you can't really be, make sure, right? Because the data sets are really big. It, it like oh. predicts as if, if I should say mm -hmm. false or this word or this word, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Have the word that is the curse word at all? Is it possible to exclude it? I think you can exclude it, but then the model will start like saying some random words. So uh, uh, you have seen maybe if you played around with these models, if you say them, they have content policy moderation. This first checks the input because they essentially want to try to capture all the uh, meaning of the language, right? So if they uh, don't capture this essential for humans, at least this part the model won't uh, really capture the language. That's why uh, most of the times they don't omit it during pre-training, but keep it and then do additional filtering at that uh, using this one. Yeah, so yeah, in theory, you could have like another language. Yeah, you can have, but uh, when the, your user inputs, for example, that word that haven't been seen in your training corpora, then the model will go off the rails and start like hallucinate or maybe come up with new cursor. So yeah, this is essentially the reinforcement learning where you minimize the harm and then et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, we are coming to the most kind of maybe, uh, yeah, sorry, sure. Yes. Yes, so uh, that's actually related to this, uh, if you mind, if I, yeah, so let's go to the llama moment. Before I answer the question, I will quickly say that this, uh, I was never expecting Mark Zuckerberg to be open source hero and him like uh, leading this space. And uh, yeah, uh, this llama moment is that right now you can run G uh, this llama models even on your phone. Like the inference happens in your phone, doesn't go to cloud. In fact, I can even show some app, it's called MLC. It's a compiler for cross compiler. Uh, for every device, a machine learning compiler, it's called. You can go to the website and it helps you do comp uh, compilation or like inference of these machine learning models on your uh, device. So because of this llama moment, uh, people can run uh, these LLMs even on your Raspberry Pi. Maybe next year we will see LLMs in your toasters. So brace yourself. So yeah, uh, maybe I will give a few more details and come to your question is that llama 2 is essentially a second generation of the Llama 1, and then it comes in different sizes, 7 billion, 13 billion, and 70 billion. They also had 33 or 34 billion version, but they didn't release it. They say they think it's buggy or they didn't want to take the risk for it. So it's not fully captured here. And then the model architecture is again transformer. Uh, it's pre-trained on two, 2 trillion tokens. So you can imagine how many words can, can that account to. And the context lens is, uh, for K. And then as I said, data collection was done both for supervised fine tuning, which is instruction fine tuning, and then they had over 1 million human preferences. And then to answer your question again, uh, for reinforcement learning from human feedback, this is particularly a problem with Llama 2, is that they tried too hard. Maybe this 1 million uh, data set was too much, and the model has this thing called false refusal because it has seen many human preferences. It's sometimes when you ask it to kill, hey, uh, tell me how to kill the Linux terminal. It says, oh, sorry, I can't really tell you how to kill because kill is like, you know, that's why you shouldn't overdo it. Essentially, reinforcement learning is very researchy area. 
only OpenAI have cracked it because they are the because the author of uh, this um, uh, algorithm called PPO uh, is essentially guy from OpenAI. So uh, only reliably, uh, but even ChatGPT sometimes can refuse some weird stuff, right? So it's very research area that's on the estimation. That's why, yeah, there, there are some diminishing returns. That's why Facebook have little bit overdone it. Even if you ask it about <clears throat> fatty food, sometimes Lama can say, oh, I really can't say anything about fatty food, etc." So yeah, it's very research area. And uh, essentially, as I said, uh, just like everything we mentioned so far, Lama have been pre-trained using uh, uh, this next word prediction, and then it have been fine-tuned uh, using the instruction data set. And then it have been taken and then did this instruction fine tuning with some more uh, fancy methods like rejection, rejection sampling and then PPO algorithm that I already said. And then it's kind of flywheel. So that's essentially uh, Lama 2 overview. Uh, and uh, when you work with Lama 2, please always try to remember that uh, they have this prompt template. And this is how they expect you to uh, query this large language model if you want to get some reliable output from it. Uh, essentially, you have some system messages and then system prompt and then ideal model answer or like user prompt and then model answer when you do few shot prompting. And then let's go to uh, kind of almost the last sessions, uh, hands on and we'll fine tune. So let's train some models. Uh, if you want, you can just uh, scan this QR code and open the uh, notebook. Uh, if you don't have laptop, don't worry. You can even run it on your phone. I hope you can see. Yeah, I tried. Maybe I tried too much to nerd it out and also make it like QR code with stable diffusion. But uh, can you open, guys? Is it working? No? Okay. But it was working for me. <laughs> okay, anyway, we can we can skip it. I can also give you... I, I can uh, open this link and walk through after we finish. Okay. I think that's better, right? Anybody disagrees? Also to save time for... Okay. Yeah, yeah, you have access to everything. Given the prompts I used to generate this image, so yeah. I, by the way, I didn't, I didn't write this explicitly. So the model generated even the text. So yeah, I can even uh, give you a summary of the Dali three paper and how it, and how it works to, to, write this text. So maybe before we close down, we can give you some take home message. And this was also generated. I was really impressed that it can take this. This is the flywheel that is nearby, but then maybe take home message is that uh, many people claim that <clears throat> LLMs can't really do something, but maybe all you need to do is a, a natural language representation of your task, and then the model can do your task. And that's basically it. Thank you very much. I uh, will take normal questions. So I think they are good on time. Um, yeah, I think these are all the references that I used to give this talk. I would be happy to answer more questions. Uh, yeah, and uh, you have you will have access to slides with lots of appendix to to cover more in details. Even the re-ranking step, the pre-training, the diminishing returns, etc. I left them as appendix in the slides, and then you can reach out to me via on Discord of Munich NLP or right now if you have questions. So maybe we can go through and let's fine tune maybe together this LLM. One second. Uh, How can we do so? Let's go. Do we have any questions before we go to the hands on session? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that I tried to say, right? Because maybe a 1 million uh, in the, like human preferences is a bit too much for these models to generalize. That's why there's bias to even uh, to say that the killing terminal is bad. It's essentially not bad in computer science, like in the terminal. So that's very research question. And I, I'm sure that uh, I'm not in a position to give you exact answer to that, but hopefully uh, you can look up some papers for that one. Any other questions or should we move to the... Can... Slides, uh, organizers, yeah, maybe organizers. Oh, yeah, we can also upload, either we will ask them for the email and send you, 
or you can look it up on our website when you can help that github that i or discord even so um not yet but yeah mini or discord yeah we will try to make sure to send you back or let me just maybe create a tiny link just now for the slides and then you can just take picture to not Oh no, one second. Maybe shorten another. MNLP, maybe. NLP 2023. Okay, so if you go to this tiny URL, you will have access to slides. So maybe you can take picture if you want right now. We'll make sure also to send at the end. Yeah, we will also upload the recording and don't worry. Okay, I think that's sure. Uh, let's go to fine tuning. Oh, okay, okay. Let me first also share this gentleman's question. I think I didn't answer. So this is the one of the ways you can run these models locally, even on your iOS, Android, and even web browser. So I think to answer this gentleman's question that how can I run them locally? Uh, this is a very nice tool to run them locally. So yeah, MLC, LLM, machine learning compiler, basically. I think that's enough. Let's go now. So for the purpose of this hands-on session, uh, we will use some off-the-shelf libraries rather than reinventing the wheel. Uh, we will use uh, we will train basically Llama 2 on a subset of a data set. Let me, so maybe first set up the GPU. Uh, the slides is embedded in the slides. So, where, or you can, can you scan this QR? Does it take you to somewhere? Oh, one second. Let me also shorten the URL. Tiny URL didn't work for you? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so for some it's working. It's weird. Anyway, let's try to just take home some messages. Uh, these details can be, we can provide it even in the, uh, in the after the talk. So I hope I have GPU, yeah, okay. I have T, so for the purpose of this uh, hands-on session, one T4 GPU, which is very old, is enough because we will use the parameter efficient fine tuning that I talked about. So you do some bunch of imports and then let's go. Uh, we will use uh, 1000 samples of uh, data sets that have been already formatted in the Llama 2 template. And then uh, we will take the chat version of uh, Llama 2, 7 billion, and trying to fine tune it. So yeah, this is the way we download the model and basically quantize before we move on. There are some quirks if we, if you work with older GPUs, some of them don't support uh, brain float 16 and then et cetera, et cetera, but this is not uh, the topic of this workshop. So just bear in mind that we have this temporary fix sometimes, and this is basically downloading the model. As I said, if you remember, it is like a lot of uh, memory space. So. Let's wait for it to download the model and then we'll move on. Yeah, so especially if you're on mobile data, then you will scream there. Right? Yeah, downloading right now. For the same thing to work on your local Python environment, would you need some specific modules? So, um, so models are already uh, called. No, no, just if you have GPU, it's better. If not, it's good. Yeah. Probably just specify the GPU. GPU? Yeah. Uh, uh, in the upcoming, I'll show you. Yeah. So if you have multiple GPUs, you can basically, uh, so device map. So yeah, so you can, if you have multiple GPUs, you can just say auto, and then it will automatically shard across the, Use the thing to yeah, yeah, it's just basically a hugging face trainer, nice and fancy. 
So yeah, as you see, the model is too big. That's why. Not sure how many shards do we have. Okay, that should be fine. Now we downloaded the model and we will load the checkpoints to the memory. Yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing some uh, research, uh, hobby research, and then some open source projects. That's why I have some knowledge, maybe. But this workshop yeah, is collaboration between Munich NLP and Tum AI. In Munich NLP, we just invite this, like researchers to explain the kind they work, and sometimes people share their cool uh, models they've built. So that's how maybe. The company. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, no, right now we don't, but probably we will try to do. Is it a company or a community? Oh, just community. Yeah, not even incorporated. It's just a bunch of, yeah. Um, yeah. So we downloaded. Let's go now, and we basically go and uh, call the Hugging Face Trainer to uh, train for fun epoch. And then this this place. By the way, we have some stickers at the front. When you can help me if you want, guys. Yeah, you can distribute. It. Yeah. So that's basically it. Then the training will take one hour, but the code is very simple. Using Hugging Face Trainer, you basically need to make sure that you don't uh, run out of memory, and you need to configure this parameter efficiency uh, arguments. Other than that, everything we will try to make it available as soon as possible, so you can uh, go back home and try it. Yeah, that's it, I guess. We can call it a day. I think we are good on time. Yeah. That's good. Thank you.